Hello, and thanks for stopping by. With its red buses, black cabs, and of course the London Underground, the oldest of its kind in the world no less, London's transport infrastructure has long played a key role in not only helping the city to develop, but also in going some way to defining its very character. Today this important history is celebrated at the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden. The museum, which is housed within an old Victorian market hall, opened in 1980, but this isn't the collection's first home. Under an array of numerous guises, and over a period spanning almost 100 years, it's been chopped and changed and housed at a surprising number of locations. In this video then, I'd like to take you through those previous incarnations of the museum, including a few intriguing examples which were never built. And as we go along, I'll also show you some of the wonderful items which now held at the Covent Garden site. If you haven't already by the way, then I'd really appreciate it if you could please consider subscribing to Rob's London, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish future videos. Likes and shares are also very much appreciated, as they really do help the channel to grow. Anyway, without any further ado, mind the gap, watch the doors, and we'll get started. One of the earliest objects related to the history of transport to be displayed in London was George Stevenson's rocket locomotive, which was donated to the Patents Office Museum, now the Science Museum, in South Kensington in 1862. At this point, the engine, which had operated on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, having triumphed at the Rainhill Trials, would have been around 33 years old. Quite young really, although within that time, steam locomotives had developed so rapidly that little old rocket would have indeed looked like a museum piece in comparison. This, for example, is a Metropolitan Railway A-Class steam locomotive, which dates from the 1860s. It's puffed away below ground during the earliest days of the London Underground. In 1915, a vintage railway carriage dating from the 1830s was put on display on the concourse at Waterloo Station, where it's remained for a good few years. This carriage, which is now looked after by the National Railway Museum, had it belonged to Cornwall's Bodmin and Wadebridge Railway, and when displayed at Waterloo, it had been mounted on a section of original track, complete with stone sleepers. Also at Waterloo, in early 1918, an American ambulance train was put on show, which for the price of eight pence, the public could view and purchase, quote, tasteful souvenirs descriptive of the train, and at around the same time, other mainline stations began curating small displays of artefacts related to their own histories, as demonstrated by these glass cabinets which are on show in Euston's Great Hall. London buses as we know them today can trace their history back to 1829 when George Shillybeer began running the first horse-drawn omnibus along a set route between Paddington and Bank. As the 1920s unfolded, the London General Omnibus Company, who at the time operated the majority of the capital's fleet, were mindful that the 100th anniversary of this landmark event was fast approaching, and so, as a means of commemorating it, they decided to preserve a small collection of historic vehicles, namely two old horse-drawn buses, which they restored and renovated in time for a celebration parade in 1929. The company also set aside an early motor bus, a B-type model, as soon as it was retired in December 1924. The bus seen on display here in Covent Garden is the same type of model and was acquired by the museum from a private collector in 2013. When the London General Omnibus Company decided to preserve a B-type model, the vehicle was only 10 years old, having been built in 1914. Even then though, its historic importance was clear. The B-type had been the world's first mass-produced motor bus. At their height, 20 per week were being produced at Walthamstow's Associated Equipment Company factory, and when the Great War erupted in August 1914, many B-type buses were requisitioned for service abroad. This B-type bus, housed in the Covent Garden Museum, also dates from 1914, 
and originally ran on the routes between Barnes and Liverpool Street Station before it was pressed into all service later that year. In 2014, to mark the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War, it was given an overhaul to represent how it would have appeared during that era. In this sobering role, painted in army green and with their windows boarded up for safety, the B-types were used to transport troops and equipment to and from the front lines, and they came to be affectionately known as Old Bill Buses. In the 1920s, a group of apprentices based at the large bus works in Chiswick also created this fine model of an old bill bus, which they gifted to the Imperial War Museum. The collection of old buses began to grow, leading the London General Omnibus Company to establish a designated museum for them in Chiswick in 1929. The following year, a journalist named Marie Crosby described a visit to the new establishment in this article for The Sphere magazine, in which she sat inside this very vehicle, which also, it would seem, appears in this footage of the centenary from 1929. The other day, in the museum of the London General Omnibus Company, I sat inside Mr Shillybeer's omnibus, or rather, an exact copy of it, Marie says. It is a long, gay green vehicle with wreaths of flowers painted on its side, bright yellow wheels and red yellow fringed blinds. There sat I, alone and unvoluminous in the museum's silence. In the 1920s, the London General Omnibus Company also put together two slideshows, lantern lectures as they were known, which told the histories of both the capital's buses and the London Underground. And for a deposit of one pound one shilling, these presentations could be hired out by any group who wished to view them. The London Underground Lecture would have certainly included details of these two items, an early electric locomotive and its accompanying car, nicknamed the Padded Cell due to its lack of windows and high cushioned seats, which dates from 1890 and ran on the City and South London Railway, which has since become part of the Northern Line. As for the Chiswick Bus Museum itself, it appears little is known of it today, which is a real shame, as it would seem we owe a lot to it for taking the first steps in preserving aspects of London's transport history. Try as I might, I've not been able to find a single image of the building, nor have I been able to ascertain its exact location, although I'd say it's a safe bet to assume it was based somewhere within the vicinity of the old Chiswick Bus Works, a site that's now covered by Chiswick Business Park. If you have any further information on the Chiswick Bus Museum, then please do let me know in the comments, as I'm very eager to discover more, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Don't forget too, there is still a museum dedicated solely to London's buses. You'll find it at Brooklyn's in Surrey. That's a big subject for another video, but I'll leave a link to that museum in the description. In 1948, as part of their post-war programme of nationalisation, Clement Attlee's Labour government established the British Transport Commission, which was tasked with overseeing a broad range of areas, everything from overhauling railway catering to creating educational films. One aspect covered by the commission related to historical relics, specifically the notion of creating a national museum dedicated to the history of British transport. Up until this point, collections related to Britain's transport history had been built piecemeal. As we've already seen, there was the Bus Museum in Chiswick, along with small collections displayed at various stations. There was also a major railway museum in York, which had been established in the 1920s by the London and North Eastern Railway. A decision was made that this array of dispersed items should be catalogued together, a task that was handed to John Scholes, a respected curator who'd built his career at the Castle Museum in York. Much of the work carried out in relation to the creation of the museum was conducted at 222 Marlebone Road, which in those days served as the headquarters for British Railways. Today it's the Landmark Hotel. The task proved to be a mammoth one. When he first started out in 1952, John found that there were around 5,000 items to be logged, but by the end of the decade, this figure had soared to 50,000, as various bits and bobs, both large and small, were either discovered, donated, or rescued from the scrap heap. 
items specific to London Transport were stored at a new site, often referred to at the time as the London Transport Museum in Surrey, specifically the country bus depot on Lesbourne Road in Rygate. The old garage is still there, it's now Grade 2 listed, although nowadays it's used as a nursery. And given we're focusing on transport history in this video, it's interesting to note that the old depot is located close to Rygate Tunnel, which dating from the early 1820s is officially recognised as Britain's oldest road tunnel. Rygate Station also has a rather lovely signal box which dates from 1929. It would appear most of the Chiswick bus collection was moved to Rygate and when London's tram network was discontinued in 1952, several tram cars and other related components were sent here for safekeeping too. To celebrate the coronation year in 1953, John Scholes selected items from the Rygate collection to create an exhibition called London on Wheels which looked at transport in the capital during the 19th century. London on Wheels was held within the Grand Shareholders Meeting Room at Houston Station, a place that's sadly long since been demolished. And from the floor plan of this event, we can see it was pretty considerable, taking visitors on the journey from the King's Highway, through waterways and early railways, right up to electrification and the Tube. In a booklet made for the London on Wheels exhibition, it was stated, Though the Euston Meeting Room is not to be regarded as a British Transport Museum, its opening as an exhibition hall should prove of great help in the development of the larger scheme which the Commission will carry to completion, as circumstances permit. London on Wills was indeed a temporary museum, as was the depot in Rygate. The growing number of artefacts was described at the time as a collection in the air, and one of John Scholes' main tasks was to identify a site in London that would be big enough to accommodate a permanent British Transport Museum. This wasn't easy. As one newspaper at the time stated, premises that are not only large enough, but also central, are difficult to find. Mr Scholes must be prepared for a long search. For a good few years, it looked as though the main contender for providing a permanent home for the Museum of British Transport was going to be the old Nine Elm Station near Vauxhall. First opened in 1838, the Nine Elms building had served as the first terminal for the London and South Western Railway, a role it maintained for a decade before the line was extended to Waterloo. The old station, which was located approximately here, where this, in my opinion at least, dreadful gaggle of tower blocks now looms, then became part of a sprawling goods depot, and the suggestion that the historic building could be transformed into a museum was first mooted in the early 1950s. However, the attraction of the site dwindled, perhaps as one report suggested, the marshalling yards are still in use, the site is not really large enough, and the smoke and grime of the surroundings would scarcely attract visitors. Eventually, a more suitable site was secured, that being a large empty bus garage on Triangle Place Clapham, just off of Clapham High Street, a spot which is now occupied by Sainsbury's supermarket, just moments away from Clapham Common Tube Station. This depot had originally been established to stable trams, but when London's tram network was wound down in the early 1950s, the building was remodelled and expanded to accommodate a large fleet of buses. However, over the course of a few months in 1958, London experienced a major bus strike, which proved devastating for the industry. In the wake of this action, passenger numbers plummeted and finances took a serious hit, leading to several depots, including the Clapham Garage, to be shut down as a cost-saving measure. Although this was dreadful for the capital's buses, it was a boon for John Scholes and his team, for it created a custom-made space for their fledgling museum, and needless to say, they quickly snapped up the old Clapham garage. Once the thousands of items, ranging from buffet car napkins to full-size locomotives, had been moved in, the Museum of British Transport finally opened its doors to the public in 1961, 
and by May 1963, over one million visitors had passed through its doors. This replica of George Stevenson's rockets would have been the first item they saw. Inside the converted depot, the collection was spread across two floors, where model boats, paintings, cars, buses, trams, cap badges, nameplates, trains, and all other manner of paraphernalia were displayed. One of the museum's prize exhibits was the record-breaking Mallard, which the museum acquired in 1964, along with the adjoining coach, which had measured and confirmed its record-breaking speed of 126 miles per hour between Grantham and Peterborough on the 3rd of July 1938. An evocative first-hand account of the Museum of British Transport was given by one journalist in the early 1960s, shortly after it first opened. There are elaborate crests and seals, brass foot warmers and silver candle holders, scale models of engines and carriages in varnished liveries, old station clocks and ticket machines, specimens of fancy upholstery, and frosted glass favoured by almost forgotten companies, and even a complete railway bookstall. Another journalist, Peter Norman, writing for the Coventry Evening Telegraph, described the museum as fantastic. Buses towered on one side, he said, and the gigantic wheels of steam locos on the other. The eye caught names that are now no more. The Newcastle and Carlisle Railway, Shitty Beers, the Grand Junction Railway, and dozens more. As wonderful as it was, Clapham's Museum of British Transport, which at the time was believed to be the largest such collection in the world, proved to be short-lived. In 1967, control of the museum was passed to the Department of Education and Science, who decided to create a new museum focused solely on railway history in York, with non-railway related items earmarked to be sent elsewhere or placed into storage. This caused considerable upsets at the time. Over 100 MPs voiced their disapproval of the plans and other schemes were quickly cobbled together and put forward which sought to keep the eclectic collection together. One such idea suggested re-establishing the museum within St Pancras Station, which at that point in the late 1960s was being threatened with closure and demolition, which is crazy to think of now isn't it? Thankfully of course, largely due to the efforts of Sir John Betjeman, St Pancras was saved Although in an alternative reality, I think it would have made a fantastic transport museum. What do you think? The other site suggested was Crystal Palace Low Level Station, now simply Crystal Palace Station, the intriguing proposal for which was outlined in the London Illustrated News in the early 1970s. There is room for a second level to be constructed over the platforms, giving another 40,000 square feet, which could be used for road vehicles. The first floor gallery could be connected to the racetrack circuit in Crystal Palace Park, which adjoins the site, so that vintage vehicles could occasionally be driven without interfering with ordinary traffic. There is also space to lay down tram tracks and adapt an existing building as a tram shed. There is also a mile or so of rail track to the main line, which could, British Rail permitting, be used for steam locomotives. In the end, of course, the National Railway Museum at York won through, which in hindsight was a good thing, as it really is an amazing place, one of the best museums in the country in my opinion. The British Transport Museum in Clapham closed its doors for good in April 1973 and was reverted back to a bus garage before being demolished in the 1990s to make way for the aforementioned supermarket. Today, one of the Clapham Museum's main successors is the Coventry Transports Museum, which contains an expansive collection of motor vehicles. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. As a consolation prize, it was agreed that items from the British Transports Museum, which was specific to London, should be kept on show within the capital. This resulted in a new, smaller museum, dubbed the London Transport Collection, to be established within the grounds of Sion Park in Hounslow a beautiful spot which is home to the Duke of Northumberland. The London Transport Collection opened here on the 23rd of May 1973, in a ceremony conducted by the Duke of Northumberland himself, who rode in on an open-top 1920s bus. 
And just like the museum's current incarnation in Covent Garden, it displayed buses, locomotives, trams and trolley buses in a large hall. We are delighted that we've been able to achieve our objective, said a spokesman for London Transport at the time, which is that these exhibits, an important part of London's heritage, will be displayed where Londoners can see them. They are a fascinating glimpse of the past and it is our intention to add to the collection as existing buses and underground trains are phased out of regular service. In 1973, as this rare poster shows, the entry fee to the London Transport Collection was a princely 25 pence or 15 pence for children and pensioners. What a bargain. The London Transport Museum in Sion Park would prove to be even more short-lived than its Clapham predecessor, ultimately occupying the site for just five years. Although situated in gorgeous surroundings, Sion Park wasn't the best location for such a museum as it wasn't readily accessible from the city centre. The nearest tube stations to the site, Boston Manor and Kew Gardens, are both over two miles away and the nearest national rail stations still require a considerable walk. As fate would have it though, the London Transport Collection had moved into Sion Park at a time when major changes were taking place in the heart of London at Covent Garden. Covent Garden, famously, had been a bustling market for centuries, with much of its character defined by a complex of purpose-built market halls. By the 1960s however, Covent Garden Market was struggling to cope with the demands placed upon it, especially when it came to handling large lorries. As such, the market was moved out to a new purpose-built facility at Nine Elms, close to the old goods yards we saw earlier in 1974. Whilst Covent Garden itself, after protests at the threats posed by hideous new developments, gained official protection. One of the buildings saved was the Old Flower Market, a 19th century masterpiece, which with its glass and cast iron architecture, bears a close resemblance to a Victorian railway station. With this grand building now empty and available in central London, the Greater London Council decided in the late 1970s to shift the London Transport Collection to this site, in the hope that it would bolster tourism. And after a major renovation of the market hall, the London Transport Museum as we know it today was opened by Princess Anne on the 28th of March 1980. As one of the first buildings to be up and running in the area, the London Transport Museum played a key role in bringing new life to the fledgling district. And within a few months, the various shops, restaurants and arts and craft market that Covent Garden is now known for were beginning to appear. As the years go by, more and more items are, naturally, added to the collection, meaning that what we see at the Covent Garden site today represents only a fraction of the overall number of artefacts. As such, the museum also maintains a huge depot over in Acton, a real Willy Wonka type of place if you're into transport history, which is open to the public several times a year. I've covered that incredible site in a previous video, which I'll link below. So please do be sure to check that out once you're finished here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this look at the history of the London Transport Museum and would love to hear your own thoughts and memories of the place. What's your favourite item on show? And were you lucky enough to see the collection when it was at Sion House or indeed the British Transport Museum in Clapham? Please let me know in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you who support my channel with your kind words, likes and shares. I couldn't do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it would be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, Thanks again for watching friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned.